Easy E, how are you? Shawnee, what's happening? I have a problem. Well, you have plenty of problems. I have plenty of problems, but I tell you my, my one problem that I'm going to bring up now that I brought up last week in the podcast that I've never brought up before. Go on. I really want a donkey. I <laughs> know. We can't get into this again. We've spent too much time talking about donkeys. Uh, because we, we spent so much time last week talking about donkeys and bodybuilders and everything that had anything really to do with any given training day and running and motivating, get people on track with training. We're switching things up. We are. We're going a bit we, different. So it's not just myself and Eric here on the intro, is it, Rachel? No, it's absolutely not. I am back again. But you- this time, I'm taking over. <laughs> She's not here to take part. I'm She's here, here to, to take, take over. And, and so exactly what? how 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 are you taking over, Rachel? What what explain to us what's going to happen? Not only in this podcast, but in a couple of podcasts over the next couple of weeks and months ahead. Yeah, so I just kind of, you know, obviously being a female, being in sport all my life, um, I'm very aware of you know, the female dropout rate compared to, you know, our male counterparts. And they actually reckon that girls are three times more likely to drop out of sport than guys around the early teenage years. And so I just kind of thought, you know, why not promote women in sport? Why not, you know, talk about it a bit more, give it a bit of a platform. So over the next, well, we'll see how long it goes for. But as you said, a few weeks, a few months, I'm going to be focusing on women in sport a bit more so having some amazing guest speakers on to talk about everything from you know just females who are doing great at their field and but also talk about training around like pregnancy and the menstrual cycle the whole way through to female specific nutrition so i'm really excited about it i think um, there's going to be some fantastic people on and hopefully everyone enjoys it well, considering all the topics just talked about there, I'm very, very happy to take a back seat in this one because I haven't got a clue what's what, what, what exactly what you're talking about and, and the in depth level that you, that you know about that. But I think, Eric, you, you have any idea? For once, Sean, I think I'm just going to let Rachel take it away from here. I think that's a good <laughs> idea as well. So, myself and Eric are going to take a back seat on this one. Rachel, what do we have in store for today's podcast? So today we have an amazing, very inspirational athlete coming on. So her name is Greta Stremkita, and I really hope I pronounced that right. Um, so anyone who was watching the Paralympic coverage there back in August would have definitely come across this name. So Greta is a 1500 meter runner. Um, she competed at the last two Paralympic Games. She's just great fun to chat to. Um, so I really, really think that people will enjoy listening to what she has to say. It's absolutely amazing. We're so lucky that Greta has come onto the show. We're so lucky to have you guiding her through the show as well and asking some great questions. It is a, a really, really good episode. So, and it's, we're looking forward to the series. It is really important. It's good that we're talking about these topics and getting great people like Greta onto the show. And so, Rachel, I think, I think we'll leave it there. I think we'll crack on with the show. Yeah, well, I just want to say that, um, you know, for any of the male listeners out there, like just before we move on to Greta, um, just from what you said about not having a clue as to what's going on, like with some of this stuff, I do think it's very important that everyone's educated in it. Because even any of you um, males out there who are listening in thinking, oh, God, this isn't for me. You never know. You might end up coaching female someday. You might be a dad. You might be a husband. You know, so I think it is important that everyone gets involved in this conversation, not just the females out there. And with that, I think we will crack on and let's have a chat with Greta. All right, you are very welcome, Greta. Now that we've sorted out all our technical issues, um, very welcome to the Any Given Run Day podcast. We are absolutely delighted to have you on. Um, and I really think our listeners are going to love hearing about you and hearing about what you've achieved as well. So I suppose let's just start with, let's introduce you. Oh, <laughs> first of all, hi for like having me. Uh, very honored and uh, well I'm a great Mikita. Um, I'm a 1500 meter runner Paralympian and uh, made to two Paralympic Games um, 
in 2016 and just recent Tokyo 2020. One and uh, yes, hoping to to make a few more, hopefully in the future. <laughs> and that is absolutely fantastic. I think already people will be very, very impressed with those achievements. But I suppose for people who are new to running, like you didn't start competitive running until like you were in your late teens, isn't that correct? Yeah, I always call myself a latecomer to the sport. <laughs> that would be like the right answer. Yes, I, to be honest, so I kind of like got involved in athletics, let's call it when I was 17. Um, but I'm like, when I look back now, obviously when I have more experience and I've been in sport longer and I learned much more now, um, I, I haven't really like, worked hard or trained hard like obviously everything comes gradually and you need to put step step by step to kind of get to harder training to get you know getting stronger bit by bit but um I really haven't like started properly training I think when I came to DCU and I joined DCU um athletics team which yeah so I was 19 then um, so I think that's when I actually met you running around yeah exactly <laughs> That's when we met and we have been chatting like this ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously you started in school um, and then you said mentioned DCU. And how did you find DCU for, I suppose, building that love of athletics? Because I think I might have talked about my college experience previously. Like I absolutely love DCU. I found the support amazing. I found the coaching, the the team, everything about it was, you know, exactly what you'd look for in a university team or even any team. So what was the experience like for you? Yeah, so I think like, so I started running with Colin the Pariers and I think, yeah, like we would have like Tuesday, Thursday sessions, you know, Saturdays and like, you know, I love, I, it was a great, I always say that it's been a great start, start. it was a great stepping stone for me, uh, but I, I felt that, yes, when I kind of like joined, uh, when I came to DCU and I joined DCU team, kind of, I just felt me like, like myself kind of drifting away and becoming more Tuesdays joining with like DCU team and you know coming training and then doing Saturday like you know meeting up with the guys in Saturday sessions and then meeting for runs and uh, I think like it's amazing like I I always love the atmosphere on Tuesday because I think it's been the biggest crowd like the biggest group of people where we do the long reps on the grass and I think like it like we've all like cool down like warm up cool down together have the chats like it's a great community and like and then like I think like then it, it really gets to like obviously get a community that you're surrounded by people that love the same sport as you do and then you know you get to learn loads lo loads of things from each other and you know encourage each other and then you know go about the goals and you know the season what you want to achieve and and I think that is so important and I always say that it's so important to be surrounded by people that lift you up and I think that that's what we had in DCU and, and I think we all lifted up each other and you know we we're all very excited to compete at the when this when the time came in the season and I think that is that is so important to have that amazing that great atmosphere you know I absolutely agree and I mean your experience mirrors my experience you know like the amount of people we had training um across all abilities like from people who maybe just joined the athletic club right up to the likes of you who's gone on to achieve incredible things at the Paralympics and um, it definitely was that culture of building people up but I think you've continued with that and um, so you've since joined um, the Dublin Track Club training with Phelan Kelly and all that crew um, I believe you just continued that DCU experience and it seems to be working really well for you. So that's what it's like like that's like really kind of can't like when I look back my journey was like it's very like from the stepping stone like I said you know joining Club Harriers was amazing and then I went to DCU and then it was another stepping stone you know learning more about athletics and then after that um I graduated and then I joined the Dublin Track Club which is like another level another step up I think because like even though in DCU we had like like you said 
different people, variety of people, which is amazing. And you need to have that. But at the same time, I believe that like, for for me, it came time a time in my in my athletics and in my journey one where like it was so important to be surrounded with people that like are looking for the same goals without be making you know Olympics, making the world champions, making European championships, no distractions. We all go in to do the work. We all do the same training sessions, you know, hitting the certain mileage. And I think like having people like all on the same focus and then like and then obviously the the group is slightly smaller so then it kind of like makes it like um it's like a kind of even more focus based and then you kind of get to focus on the little things that matter and little things that makes the difference and I think that actually worked out for me really well um I think it's it's been like it's going to be two years that I'm with the with the double track club it's hard to believe <laughs> it's going to that be is two incredible years. yeah yeah and, 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 it is such a great thing to have that support, as you said, the people with the same goals, maybe aiming for um, things at the same level that you are. Um, but I suppose for people listening who are thinking, OK, I just want to go out and just achieve a 5K at the park run. I think the philosophy is still the same, like that whole group mentality. If you are surrounded by people who just have the same goal as you and that goal is just to hold your fitness for a park run each week. I think that's important no matter what level you're at and your experience, like you said, your stepping stones the whole way up. You've surrounded yourself with people who, you know, have built you up and provided you with whatever support you need at the stage you're at, um, which is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. Like I, I do believe like, First of all, yes, it's the little steps, the small, like you you need to throw in your sub hole, you know, all in and see, I'm going to go and do 5K straight away. Like I think little step by step, little goals, you know, getting yourself used to the, you know, little runs and then building it up and also like be absolutely like surrounding yourself with, let's say, you know, getting a friend and say, okay, we're going to focus on this together. And like, you know, we're going to achieve like, uh, you know, do a small workouts together and okay, we're going to do this 5k together, you know, set a goal of like getting like um, a 5k road race, you know, or like a park run. And then like, okay, this is our goal and we have to train for a month, month and then we'll run it. And then this is our stepping stone. And then we, okay, we'll try to get the time down. And like, that that's there's nothing really dramatic to it there's nothing there's no quick fix there's no quick results I think we just kind of need to be patient enjoy the process you know do those little runs you know running is amazing to clear your head and you know just to be like I like running as well like to be with myself and gather my thoughts and I think like that simple things like that and then I think like just day by day week by week you're going to feel the difference you're going to feel better you know each week each month and you know you'll see your 5k park runs you know times going down that is absolutely fantastic advice um and so you know that's relevant to every level yeah so I think we'll just take a step back then so we've obviously mentioned that you are a Paralympian but maybe tell us a bit about your background so if you're don't mind telling us you compete in the T13 class. So what does that mean? Um, and I suppose, tell us a bit about Greta from Lithuania. Hi, yes, Greta from Lithuania. Um, so I always joke around this. When people like ask me from where you're from, I was like, what do you mean? Do you mean from what country or where do you live in Ireland? But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, so originally I am from Lithuania. Um, I came to Ireland when I was 15 years old. And uh, yes, like it's it's been uh, an interesting journey. Um I always say, like, when I look back, I was like, when did I felt like Ireland is, was my home? And I feel like, um, yeah, around, like after like around three years when my English got better and then I, you know, met, had more friends and, you know, learned the, the Irish culture and Irish sense of humor and all the things like that. <laughs> <laughs> because let's face it, we have the best sense of humor in the yeah, world. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it definitely takes time to get a hang of it. So I, think, I, I think you definitely have it. I just remember from when we were in, um, when we were training down 
in Portugal one time and we actually roomed together. Oh, we did. <laughs> I just remember every night being like, I should be going to sleep. You know, we're on a training camp <laughs> and just laughing my head off with you. Like, I just remember that so clearly that we just used to laugh for so long before we'd uh, turn the lights off. Um, don't tell Enda Fitzpatrick now. Yeah. Us both, but <laughs> yeah, sleep is very important, what I remember. Guys. It's a part of recovery. <gasps> oh, yeah. But, oh, and it's amazing. Yeah, and so... So I think, yeah, so those three, after those, I think three years, I kind of like started feeling more like at home and I, I, and it is important to highlight that I think like sports athletics, like definitely kind of contributed to me feeling like Ireland is my home and, and not feeling Ireland being my home now, 11 years later. So I think like that is important to like, it's incredible what sports can do when you get involved in it. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, so like I said, uh, I started, um, kind of like running when I was 17 and then uh, kind of was setting up goals, you know, joined the Colin Farriers and then it's like, okay, we'll see if maybe then I heard about the Paralympic Games and I was like, okay, we'll see if it would be possibility for me to make make it um, the Games. And uh, I was setting 21 when there was a Rio 2016 Paralympic Games and I was able to get the standard. And um, then I just went and... And yes, I then did my best. Rest from there. So, yeah. Um, can you tell us then how you qualify to be a Paralympian or a para athlete? Um, so I suppose we'll start with, and I remember the first time you told me you were a triplet. I don't think I'd ever yeah. met a triplet before. And we were running around um the pitches at a GCU training session. <laughs> And you mentioned that obviously you have a triplet, you have a sister and a brother. And I suppose your journey with your disability started, you know, when you were essentially born. So will you yeah. talk us through that, please? Because, um, you know, it is such an inspiring story. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we can actually go to, I think, to the very start. Um, so, yes, I'm a triplet and um as the triplets, uh, you know, as it is um, more like often uh, that you, we were born prematurely and uh, we were put into incubator uh, because we were so tiny. So we were like four months, four, sorry, four weeks. We were born four weeks early. And um, yes, yeah, so we were in incubator. And uh, I think I was one of the weakest babies. And um, so the way... Uh, my life turned out let's call it because my brother and sister are absolutely have no uh sight issues so uh, because I was um weaker uh and I was in the incubator they increased the oxygen for my lungs to develop but that meant that um it the oxygen that was in the incubator damaged my retina and um so obviously then, you know, with the time when we were like getting a bit, you know, we're growing up, the doctors noticed that something was not right. And uh, yeah, they, they seen that, um, yeah, Greta is probably going to be blind. Uh, that was the first. Um, and that, that was, was fully the, blind at the time, correct? Yeah, yeah, I was fully blind at the time. And uh, they were like saying to my mom, my dad and my, like my parents are absolutely amazing. They're the best. The, the, the most determined people I have ever met and um so yeah the, the doctor said like you have to accept it you know your child is going to be blind you're not the first parents with a blind child but obviously my parents like no we're not accepting and that's not not the case so but uh, so how everything turned out was um that so my my mom obviously stayed in the hospital with, with us because I had to stay in a hospital to to know to get bigger and stay in the incubator for a while and this, this nurse comes to my mom and she was like, there's these doctors from Sweden. Um, I think you need to bring Greta for them to have a, to look at her. And, and I think they could help her. So my mom was like, absolutely, I'm going to do that. So she brought me to them and they looked at me and they were like, okay, yes, we can help Greta. It would be experimental, experimental surgery, uh, but we have to like act now because babies grow very quickly. And like, we want to save as much vision as we can we need to we need to act quickly so uh my parents then made the like it was it was complicated to just to put it briefly it was complicated to uh 
to get it sorted and for me to leave Lithuania back then because of the Soviet Union and, and all the restrictions and everything. And there's a bit like longer story to that. But- <laughs> Briefly, <laughs> but briefly, um, so my parents did everything what they could and it wasn't easy for me to actually leave Lithuania. So myself and my mom, we went to Sweden and uh, they got the surgery done and they were able to save some of my vision for which I'm going to be always so grateful. And uh, so, yeah, so in the Paralympic terms, uh, I'm a teacher, teen athlete. And like I said, best with the worst vision um so that <laughs> is the class for where we are the best we are having the best vision oh, um, yeah. in all the paralympians we because there's a t11 that the people if the athletes are blind and they have guides there's t12 that are in the, between and then there's there, there we. So if I would have a bit more vision, like I will be probably out of the Paralympic sport. But um, yes, yeah, so that's that's the story. And like it's incredible that you know you were so unfortunate to lose it, but that you have such a positive outlook. Like you said, you're going to be forever grateful. Um, so you're like. I think just your whole um, attitude towards everything is just so uplifting. Um, you know, it just, it happened. We can't change it. But you are definitely making the the best of what could have been a much worse situation. Like, um, and like, I know your parents to this day are your number one supporters. I know you do be taking your dad to the gym with you and <laughs> showing him how it's done. Um, but it's just so amazing to have that support in your corner from, I suppose, a personal point of view, like from, you know, your family that they're behind you every step of the way. Wouldn't you agree? I think it's like the opposite. I have to be grateful to my dad because he actually was the one when we came to Ireland. He was the one like he was always very sporty. Um he was always very sporty and uh, like my brother as well. So I think we were like, when we came to Ireland, we were trio. So we would go to the gym. So myself and my brother and my dad, and like, we would go to the gym and my dad, like it was a thing. Like, I remember back down, like it was the way we spent time. So myself and my dad, I learned so much from him, like going to the gym and things that you would do. And like, so it was like, kind of like, I was even like went to gym geez when I was probably like 15 or something just doing like little bits by bits and you know that made me like stronger and all and you know and I gained knowledge about like how gym works and my dad shared everything what he knew with me um so I think like he contributed with that very much and like yeah so we were kind of trio and obviously it's pretty we don't really like it's you know life turns out and we don't really do that much but like we always kind of like have the chats with my dad I call him and say okay right I've been to the gym and then he tells me what he does or something that he pulled and I would always give out to him you clearly don't do enough stretching (laughs) but he never listens I suppose that's family (laughs) (laughs) very true and I have been to the gym with you and you are probably the strongest athlete I've ever met like you are just incredible and like you obviously love it and I think that's such an important aspect of sport like I think people think if you're a runner I'm running like I'm not going to go to the gym I'm not you know that's not running but you really embrace that nope if I want to be stronger like out when I'm running on the track I need to build up that strength in the gym and you certainly have that (laughs) yeah like um yeah I am I am very I'm very much advocate for the gym I always been and I think like uh people like at the start I think they're probably like oh my god Greta like you're a bit obsessed but I think more and more people like kind of like no it's actually like the right way to be and like more and more people around me than I see them like doing like making gym more important like running is important I love running miles works great for me but like but the one thing that like I think in the past definitely wasn't the case people didn't think the gym is equally important as running like they thought that it's like oh yeah like I'll do it one day or I'm not gonna do it one day and it's like it's a kind of an addition to running which is like it's not true like I I believe that it's equally important because it's like those things like, you know, if you're going to get, if you're not going to look after yourself, if you're not going to get sleep, if you're not going to eat enough, you're going to break down. It doesn't matter how many miles you're going to do or how many training sessions you're going to do. Same with gym. If you're going to go to gym, injuries happen. We all athletes, this is a part of the journey, but 
as an athlete, it's our, our responsibility is to be as strong as possible and we'll be able to handle the training as best as we can. So going to the gym like gives you an opportunity to do so. Like it gives you opportunity to be stronger, it gives you opportunity to apply metric work, work will give you, you know, the the strength to to hit the ground, to to be able to handle the load and and that that all the things that at the end makes the difference because if you can you know be as little as less injured as you possibly can that will allow you to do the training and that will allow you to be a faster athlete so because the always i found it so funny when people like because i knew a lot of athletes like like a couple of years now i think more and more gym is getting more and more important which i love but even but even before that was the case, like maybe four years ago, um, I remember then talking with artists like, oh, I got injured and now I need to do hip rehab. And I was like, well, yeah, that's basically the same work that you could have done previously at the gym to prevent that. So it's kind of like just to look at it one way or another, because eventually, if you're not going to do the work, it will catch up with you and eventually you're going to need to do it. But then you're going to need to do it because you got injured and not because as a not preventative thing. So that's the way I look at it. And then that's kind of my perspective. But like, I'm very happy to see it as like the philosophy, I think, towards coaches, the money, as many coaches I've worked, for, worked with and had chat, chats with, I think more and more that attitude is changed. And I think more and more it's like, okay, okay, no, we have to prioritize gym. And it is equally important as miles and training se- running training sessions. Yeah, exactly. And like you mentioned that preventative stuff, um, if you are keeping, like, as you said, you're going to get enough sleep, you're going to eat enough, but are you, like you said about your dad, are you stretching enough? Um, are you, you know, making sure your body is able to take on the load of running and that load is what you build up in the gym. So, um, yeah, like even if people maybe can't make the time to get running or I know over the winter months, like, I'm the worst for it. Like, oh, it's raining outside. Oh, will I run today? Like you you can substitute a run for the gym and still get benefits. Would you agree with that? Yeah, like definitely. And I think the more, like, especially like if we're talking about like, you know, every day, like, and a person that when athletics is not your work or it's not your full-time, like you need to do it for the love of it. Like, so, and variety, I think is so important. And I think variety is that what makes a difference. Like you want to be, let's say a 5K runner, or you want to be, or you need to be just enjoy the process of running. So that's okay. Like if you don't have time, you know, to do a run in a gym, that's okay. So then, you know, have two, two gym sessions a week, have the, you know, the rest of the days, let's say three, the rest of like, so two days of gym, then you could have like four days of running, you know, you could do even two running sessions, you know, and that's, and then do some easy runs. Like that's, that's going to be eventually plenty for you. And like, you're going to be healthy. You will be able to enjoy the runs, you, you know, you'll be able to like, you know, in those gym sessions, you can include the stretching or like, you know, like foam rolling. That's it's very important. And people forget they want to do like all the stuff. And I was like, Oh, I'm so tired. I was like, did you foam roll? I was like, no, well, you know those kind of little yeah. things so like if you if you like if you want to like do something like it comes with stuff that you need to also do you know what I mean like even okay if you want to run that's absolutely fine but then you have to do the stretching you need to respect your body so then you need to do the stretches you need to do the foam rolling you know to be able because you want it for you to do what you wanted to do so you need to do make sure that you did everything for your side to allow your body to do it and that's absolutely correct because if you're demanding a lot of your body your body's going to be like well you know you gotta look after me like I'm the one pulling you through these miles like give me some love like give me some um you know prehab to help me deal with that and but like I suppose for people who maybe are starting out and don't want to fork out a lot of money to join a gym, like a lot of the gym exercises and stuff can be done at home. And like a foam roller, you can pick them up. Um, Aldi or Little has them every year. You can buy them in any sport shop. Um, so things like that aren't going to set you back that much. And you can do all this at home. You can maybe do some body weight stuff. So like gym work for people starting out 
doesn't have to mean going to the gym and lifting heavy or using the fancy machines. Like it can be as simple as get a foam roller, do some yoga, do some foam rolling, stretching, uh, plyometrics, like hops, skips, things like that. You don't actually need the fancy equipment. Oh, but absolutely. Like COVID showed us how much you can do at home. There's plenty of videos for like, you know, cardio videos that absolutely like, you're going to be sweating buckets and there's like i do like so many like circuits for example that like the only thing is a, you need a box or like i don't know maybe like on a chip like no maybe you have a box open the chair <laughs> <laughs> like you know where you can absolutely i would have been absolute bits and like yes absolutely we single leg stuff like you could do so much things and COVID taught us we don't even need to i think explain this much because like People yeah, everyone lived through COVID. Themselves. And we had no gyms and we were like, I was able to maintain my strength. So like, if I'm able to maintain my strength, you know, when, you know, you would go to gym and you will live heavy. I think you can definitely then be able to, you know, build up your strength, even from the workouts like, that you would do at home. And so that's definitely, and like, I think it is, that's what it's like when you're doing it for enjoyment and just to feeling good, the variety is so important and there's no need overthinking it, but it's just important to have that balance and, you know, just to make sure that that body is healthy and you, you don't run yourself into the ground. Exactly. But I suppose let's go back to running and let's go back to what I'm sure people are dying to hear, which is your incredible results. So, I mean, we can't have you on. We can't talk about you and everything you've done without actually saying, hang on, like your results have been phenomenal. And like, as you said, you're only getting started. Like hopefully there's many more to come, but take us back to your first Irish, um, your first Irish trip away, getting that first green singlet. Where was it and how incredible did you do? Well, I don't know. I can I never, to be honest, I never, um, I never kind of say that like I did do well and like it's uh, like it's not. I I don't say that because I think there's always you know how in sport how it is like there's always going to be somebody faster than you are, and at this point there's a lot of fast girls. So I'm kind of, <laughs> I still have a long way to go, and and I love it, and that's what you want, like. Uh, that's the journey that you want. Uh, but so, yeah, so my first, um, uh, so my first international race was European Championships in Grosseto. And it was in 2016. It was just because just before going to uh, Rio, which was great to have that a bit of experience of what international race is like. Um, so, yeah, so I came there third in European Championships. Um, but geez, when I look back, like, oh, like, oh, I was so not, I didn't know it wasn't like a much better athlete than I was back then. Wait, people are here listening to this going, okay, you're a much better athlete, but come on, you're actually going to your first European Championships and you've walked away with a bronze medal. Like, yeah, yeah. And but- you, you're not going to say that you did well. <laughs> I uh, know, like back, but you see, we're those athletes were like, we were like, we're never happy. So, I think back then, yeah, uh, that is so true. As like, as an artist, like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But then, like, I had even after, even Rio was like, so then I went to Rio and I and I came forth. And even Rio was like, um, was like, I knew that it was my stepping stone. Like I knew that, you know, it's kind of like beginning and I knew that realistically I'm going to be closest to the medal uh, and like, like closest to the medal, but like realistically closest to the medal uh, when I'm going to go to my next part of the games. And, and that was Tokyo. Yeah. So, and I, and I, and I love that I had t- that time that like build that knowledge about the sport, like build my body to maintain, you know, the, the mileage now that I do and, you know, the training that I do. So I think like all these, these things are like important. So that's why I don't really, um, like, yes, it's amazing, but it's a part of the journey. And like, I, I don't, I think when I retire, then I'm going to look more as like, oh, like, you know, what did you achieve or what did you do? But like, at this time, it's like, it's not over. Like, you know, the finish- yeah, you're kind of, you're not dwelling on the past. Yeah. But I think I- the fact that you came fourth in Rio, um, it made you realize 
the potential is there. Like you can come back with a medal. Well, like I believe you can come back with a medal. So obviously Tokyo with the extra year, you know, you were feeling pretty good. Um, didn't quite work out the way you would hope. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk us through that whole experience, like the emotional side of Tokyo yeah. and, you know, starting with hearing that the games were postponed for a year, right yeah. up to adjusting your training and then the actual race itself. So when I, so when the COVID hit and when we're like, we're like, okay, like this is going to be postponed. Um, the games will be postponed. For me, it was the best thing in the sky. It's like everybody's like, oh my God, like this was... But for me, it was a great, because that was just the time. It was after World Championships, and that's where I joined um, the Blink Track Club. Uh, that was the year, and I knew I needed that year for, like, to, uh, you know, adapt to training and, like, you know, get the, get, you know, get used to training. I needed that year. So for me, I was like, thank God, like, this was the, that, that it couldn't work out. It was sad, like, in a way that, like, it was sad in terms of, like, you know, it was a world crisis. Like, you know what I mean? From that perspective, it was sad that like there were some athletes in the in the great shape and, you know, they didn't got to go or people who were like, were retiring and then didn't know what to do. Like for other athletes, it was difficult. And like, but for me personally, like for me, it was blessing in the sky. It's like, okay, that's why I, I needed that year. And that worked out brilliantly um, because I was able to, you know, see how much my body can handle training wise. And then that year, then the other year came and I was like, okay, I, like that extra year I see like benefit me, that benefited me so well. And, you know, and then last, this, this season started, you know, with the, with the I knew that I was in a good shape. Um, you know, I, I was like around PBs and um, like, I knew I was confident. And even before when we went to Tokyo last, se last session I did, I was like, I knew that I was in good shape. And I was like, I, I remember I, during, during this session, I was like, I, was, I couldn't believe sometimes and like how well I ran. I just couldn't believe it. And then I was in a session with um, James Nolan when she managed her uh, double Olympic. <laughs> and it was like, okay, brother, relax. You need to focus on the next. <laughs> I was like, okay, but I'm feeling so good. <laughs> <laughs> just so eager and just wanting yeah, to get was, there. Yeah. And I finished that and I was like, oh my God, like I'm ready to go now. Um, so like, that's what I kind of needed. So, um, so it was a heat and the final. So like we hit, I knew what I, and I was so happy with that. I, I ha was happy that I had like, could have raced the girls before, after the final. And, and uh, so I was, so yeah, I knew what I had to do and uh, like I was confident in doing it and I, and I was like, that's no problem. I can run, you know, front run the, the first race and, you know, just to secure my slot, not, not to go too fast and not too slow. Um, so that, that was all perfect. And um, so then like, yeah, I remember that even like you knew because the final was next day. So we had no like, because in Rio we had heat and a final, but we had one day in between to recover. So that I give you an extra day which this time we didn't like next next evening like so friday was the heat and then saturday was the final and i was like okay okay brother i need to get your eyes back in so i was like me and my competitor spanish girl were like oh i know you're gonna be here so we we're like both having the ice baths and like you know preparing for um for you know the next day and then i was like okay brother you need to sleep and i think it was like i remember making my bed that saturday morning because like you're waiting for his like five years and I just I could not wrap my head around as like oh my god I'm actually waiting for the final today it was so weird I remember that moment thinking I was like Jesus so but then yeah so the final comes and um I was like you know I was kind of like getting nervous at the warm-up track and I was like okay make sure you had the pace because it was a tactical 1500 meters and I had my my role to play you know I had to do I had to dictate the race from the start to make sure that works in my advantage because there were some girls that are incredibly fast and they could have done whatever they wanted but that could have worked in my disadvantage because if the race goes slow from the start it means that more slow the girls that are less endurance based and more speedy girls they would come into play for the last lap and that's what we didn't want. We didn't want extra people that shouldn't be there. So 
so yeah so then I was like so it was the tactics to play so uh I went in and you know I knew I'm gonna take on the first lot make sure that it's fast and people that you're supposed to burn the people that didn't didn't want to have them for the last wrap lap and that kind of worked out and I was kind of like and then it was like third lap and I was like this is like I can't remember much of the race I can't because I wasn't absolute I was in the zone but I remember the last lap like I, like everything is like a blur I was like it was insane like but it was a battle and I loved it. the actual race was incredible um so and I remember it was probably 200 meters to go. And I remember making a decision of like, okay, I'm going to hit it now. I'm going now. And I was, because I got so excited, I was never in my life being in the position where I, I can, I was sec, I was stirred. And I was like, oh my God, is it the case that I could be second? Like, And I was like getting so excited. And I was like, and I said, okay, like I knew it's going to take a risk. And I was like, I have to just go now, which was my mistake. And that eventually caused me to come fifth because I died. And those 200 meters was longer than I expected it to be. <laughs> and, and yes, it was. And, but like, I went into the race, um, I went into the race saying, like, I think like, to, we were saying to films, like, obviously want to get the medal and I was realistically capable of getting the medal obviously 50 meters tactical race and like if you play your cards wrong which I did you know you're 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 not getting it but one thing that we did say that was a, I think a priority was like you have to make sure that you did like my goal was like I had to make sure that you put everything out there that you're absolutely no regrets that was one thing because the worst thing that added can have is regrets knowing that oh my god I could have went quicker and I did not want to that I was like no that's one thing that I would have been disappointed regardless what the results would have been so but I remember like being absolutely deaf and as like after crossing the finish line and then I I knew something went wrong like I wasn't when I didn't meddle I knew something was wrong but I couldn't there was so much emotions I was like yeah, it was awful crying on the national television. <laughs> but I was doing the interview to the RTE and uh, I was, um, and at the moment I was, at the same time I was trying to think what went wrong because I knew that I made mistakes somewhere because, I, but I got so excited during the race. I was like so ready to go, but I didn't realize at that point in time that that was my mistake. And then obviously like I took my, I was like, you know, having a moment of, of, of you know, of sadness, let's call it, um, and disappointment. Um, and then I kind of went into to the uh, warm-up track and then I was kind of like seeing Michael McKillop was doing his session and the 1500 meter guy as well. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like, okay, I need to like try to cool down. Cool down was so hard because you kind of, there was so much emotion, but then you kind of have to like, rather like suck it up. Like there's nothing that you can do about it. And you just have to move on because the more you think about it, like it makes no difference at this point. You just have to learn from what went wrong. And then obviously then he comes up with me. I'm just, you know, and then he tells me like, Greta, Greta, like, like it was just so unfortunate because there's just one thing that you want did wrong. And then he told me, and I was like, yes, that was it. Because I knew that something went wrong from my side. Uh, like you obviously don't know if I would have made it. But if I would have not done that mistake, I would have probably, it would, I just would have had more chances. I would have been stronger at the finish line and the girls would have not passed me. Hopefully, would have. like, it's always a kind of like, you never know, but like, but always the stronger you finish, like the more, the more chances you have to battle for that last few meters with other competitors. So yeah, so that was the, that, that was the experience of my Tokyo games. <laughs> And a really emotional one there. But I think no matter what level you're at, everyone has definitely experienced that, the whole idea of that last 200 meters being like the longest 200 meters in existence. Um, you definitely took us through that um, very detailed. I think people will really get a feel for what you went through. Um, but you look at it with such a positive light. And I think, you know, Yes, it was maybe a mistake, but 
it was a risk. Like you were willing to put everything out there on the track. You gave it your absolute all. And that's one thing about you. You have always done that. You have always thrown yourself in and given 110% like above and beyond. Um, I know that people listening obviously can't see it, but you have an optimist wrote on you have optimist wrote on your jumper there. And I think that really <laughs> sums you up. <laughs> You're just so positive. You just, um, <laughs> you know, even though it was a really, you know, emotional experience for you, you got through it. You look on the bright side and, you know, it probably makes you hungrier now for, is it Paris 20? Yeah, four. Sorry, 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is, and like, like that, like that's what it is. Like, but it made me more, even more confident athlete. You know, you get to do this, you know, tactics. You get to like, you know, you learn that two hundred meters are longer than you think. <laughs> but I don't think it is, and like, and like, but you see, the one thing that like I enjoyed the racing. I enjoyed that race so much, and I finished. I was like, that was the race. Like we, we battled for like every person battled for the race and that's what you want like that's what makes sport exciting and I know we're like we all want to get the medals and obviously you know hopefully one day I get to medal um which I'm working towards and I I believe that hopefully even if that's gonna be my last Paralympic Games hopefully that I will but like but the one thing that like the wind of itself to enjoy and like enjoy racing and enjoy competing with other people like and like you said even making those risks like or getting excited like I was like 200 meters like oh my god it could be second like you know, <laughs> I was like and that's what it makes like I think that's what it, and I think we all want the medal but that excitement of like racing and like competing and like I think like that is like that is something that like you know, like no, like not like no metal can, but that experience is definitely like no metal can buy. Like you know, and I think that's why, like I think, like I look at this like games like so positively. Like yes, I got, I, I had a chance of like probably getting, you know, like coming third and all that kind of stuff. But like, but I because as an athlete, I seen like a quite what journey like I went, and I'm still on my journey. But like to get to the level and you know be able to compete and race and do things that like you know you need to do as an athlete and like you know that is that is very like I think like exciting part of of athletics which I think we sometimes tend to forget because like, oh, it's all the medals and all that kind of stuff but like you know when like in the past coaches would tell me Greta enjoyed I was like what do you mean like I'm gonna be like in pain now <laughs> <We're>, like <laughs> I what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean enjoy it? This is yeah. torture. And it's self-inflicted torture. I chose this. <laughs> so, like, I know that like you love the like PBs, you know, it's all worth it. But like, you know, but then you kind of like now when you kind of like look back, it's like, yes, because like when you compete, like and when you like when you go for something, like when you actually compete against you forget about the pain. The pain is there. But you don't think about it. You're thinking about, okay, okay, how do I, like, how do I move this? What would be the best, you know, place for me to place there? Like, how am I going to, like, push that girl or shove that girl out of my way? <laughs> that's what you think about, like, fighting to get to there. So I think, like, that's what it makes it all difference. And that's what I think, like, makes it, like, a great race, even though sometimes that result is not the one that you wanted. Maybe we should have put you into boxing instead of athletic. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing the fiery Greta come to life here. <laughs> kind of scared. <laughs> so yeah, this is my my passionate moment of, uh, <laughs> of the race in Tokyo. But it is wonderful to see for you that it's not just about the medal. Like hopefully the medal comes like, I mean, I will be 100% in your corner and I believe that you can do it. But it is nice to see that it means more to you than just a medal. Like yeah. it is a lifestyle. It is, you know, a passion and you just absolutely love it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like it's a, it is like, and like we a lot of like talk about like what is like high performance, what is to be a high performance athlete, like elite athlete and what like a lot of like aspects go into it. And like, even I'm learning, but like I, I, I do agree that like it is a lifestyle. It is certain choices that you make. It is like 
enjoying like the process, like, you know, the journey. And then like, obviously the mental aspect, the way you approach things as well. Like, you know, when things go well or, or when things go bad, like I think like these, or like even like strategies or things that you do about it. So I think it's all like combines into one, into one, like your, you know as, as a journey you know as an athlete so yeah you can't control everything that happens mm. but you can control how you respond to it yeah and you can control your reaction and the actions you take after that yeah and you can definitely put them to some good um so I like obviously um a few days ago was world sight day um so I just think it's amazing to have you on like so near to that um and you know I really believe in the whole um you know the philosophy of if she can't see it she can't be it and yeah. I think you are doing wonderful things for the sport that you don't even realize in terms of giving more people with disabilities who are maybe too shy to try it you're being that role model for them and you're saying look nothing is stepping in my way. I'm Greta. I'm an athlete. I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. If that gets me medals, it gets me medals. If not, I just love it. It's bringing me enjoyment. And I do think for a lot of young people out there, especially young girls with disabilities um, or not, I just think you're a fantastic role model for them. Well, no, I never, I never like, I'm not a kind of like, oh, role model because like it's not like I'm being like oh you know like uh, you know I'm not all about that stuff because but I'm not the reason why I'm saying that is because like you always need to start from yourself so like it's what you do what you like I don't do things specifically like you know to encourage other people or motivate other people like I do as selfish as that's gonna sound like I do what I need to do and you know and like, if there's going to be people that like, that can take something like something from it, like it's amazing. If they can't, you know, or resonate with me, that's absolutely fine. But I do like, I like for me, you know, kids and like, like, you, you know, the new generation, you know, of possible athletes, I think it's like, it's so, so important. And like, that's why like, um, but it's more like not even for them to be like a generation of new athletes. It's more like to have for kids to be active, like for kids to find even what they love. Like because like I would be with the program with Dare to Believe. And like my message to kids always is at the end of my story that like the key for it, everything is that you find what you love. And that's that's it. As an athlete, we are so lucky because we do what we love. Like there's no other way around. If you don't like, don't love what you do, if you, like if you don't love sport, you can't be an athlete. You can't be a good, like there's, you just can't. Like it's, you, there's no other way. Like you have to love what you do. So like, that's all like always like to kids when I see in there to believe programs, like my message is always that you need to find what you love and that will make all the difference. And it doesn't matter what it is. Like, if it's sports, it's great. But like, if it's like, you know, if you play piano or you draw, you know, what arts, you know, whatever like makes you happy, that's going to make a difference. And that's where you're going to, you'll be willing to work for and you'll be passionate about. And that's what's going to make you happy. So like, as much as I like, like to promote sports and, you know, um, to people, to kids, doesn't matter with the vision, parent, you know, disability or without or no disability, for me, it's the most important thing that they will be, they will be brave, that they would be brave enough to, to, to try different things to, and to find the things that they actually going to enjoy doing it. And I think that is just an amazing message to send out that it doesn't have to be sport. You don't have to be the best at it. You just have to love it and disability or no disability. If you love it, you will work for it. Yeah, exactly. That's the best way to put it. I need <laughs> sentences. You just put it out straight away there. <laughs> just, <laughs> just paraphrasing, summarizing, you know, have Very to do good. that. At the end of a chapter, you need to summarize it all. Exactly. <laughs> 
Well, Greta, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. And I hope you've had fun. I've had a lot of fun talking to you. Um, I mean, we'll probably talk for another hour or so. But <laughs> um, you know, we could absolutely talk all day. But yeah. definitely on behalf of the Any Given Run Day crew and all our listeners, you know, we wish you the very best of luck with everything. And I'm sure everyone is going to be following your journey, watching to the next championships and definitely to the next Paralympic championships. So very, very best of luck with that. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been our pleasure.